Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to the remarkable poem, A Song of Joys. Now, uh, there's just so many ways that we've got to start this conversation. One of these, we've spoken about this before in earlier lectures. Whitman once wrote, I stand for the sunny point of view, stand for the joyful conclusions. And there's no question, Whitman in his own time took a lot of heat for his optimism. We like to call it an, not an ideal optimism, but rather an informed optimism, and we've said this before. It's not that Whitman is just happy all the time. No, no, no. And in fact, we're going to see that in fact in this very poem. Whitman is willing to accept the darker, sadder parts of life, right? I mean, as we've talked about our theodicy question, why must bad things have to happen? However, in the end, and this will be one of the things that attracts so many of us to the reading of Leaves of Grass, Whitman is going to go ahead and make the argument, look, let's go ahead and try to see the sunny side of life, and we're, we're going to get into this in this poem. Now, this is an interesting poem to me because many of my students will say, I've never heard or read this poem, and yet there are lines that have been quoted, put on posters and the like from this set of lines and so uh, this poem. So that will, that will interest us as well. Now, the assumption here is that you've been following our stuff at learnstrong.net down that left-hand side, talks with Walt is the name of our playlist all the way from the very beginning and the inscriptions. We're going to, in fact, reference Eidolons right away and starting from Pominach. It's interesting the way this poem is in many ways a, a kind of subsuming of so many of the earlier lines that have happened. We're going to comment a lot on Song of Myself. Our hope is that you've been following us all the way up through the, the text which preceded it, our O Fulage, and uh, you've been annotating yourself. Now, you're going to do a lot of annotating if you have your own copy of a Song of Joys. And, of course, we have to think about Ode to Joy when we think about the famous Schiller poem, as well as, obviously, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. In many ways, this is the very heart of this, as we call it, the Book of Songs, the Book of Psalms in Whitman's uh, New American Bible, as we have called it. Maybe this is um, uh, Psalm 119, that center of the Book of Psalms. I don't know. There's always a wonderful debate about which is the greatest song, the song of the open road, song of joys, and on and on it goes. Let's begin, of course, uh, with our Nortons, and, they, and Nortons will tell us at the beginning that this poem was entitled originally Poem of Joys when it first appeared in 1860, and Poems of Joy in 1867. The poem reverted to its present title in 1871 and 1876, and took its present title in 1881. Based on personal reminences, and we'll get to this, it's such an important part of how you read this poem, but designed like Song of the Open Road to celebrate the American experience generally, the poem underwent considerable alterations by excision, addition, transposition. The most notable addition was that in 1871 of a passage, lines 121 through 133, which may indicate a fresh access of confidence after the tribulations of the Civil War. The manuscripts show that what Whitman had been working upon this theme since the early 1850s. For example, he made the following entry in a pre-1855 notebook. Quote, Poem incarnating the mind of an old man whose life has been magnificently developed, the wildest and most exuberant joy, the utterance of hope and floods of anticipation, faith in whatever happens, but all enfolded on joy, 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 which underlies and overtops the whole effusion, end quote. I mean, that, uh, that, that gives you a real good sense of what we're about to read here. I have pointed out to you that the Declaration of Independence, that precious document, and we've given a full lecture on it elsewhere at LearnStrong.net, was very influential for uh, Whitman for a number of reasons, not least of which two times the word happiness gets used there. There is an argument to be made that foundational to what it means to being an American is the idea of joy, the idea of optimism, the idea of progress. And of course, I think today we could make the argument, this is what must be read and studied again. Let's try and capture some of that as we begin. Now, 
There's uh, um, lots and lots of memories of Whitman's early life that's happening here, especially his clamming as a child when he went out to get clams. We're going we're gonna to see this here. Hey, uh, just right away, let's point out, the word O, it'll take us back to uh, starting from Pominock, that last passage, right? The word O um, will get used 41 times in this poem. There will be 51 exclamation points, and the word joy or joys will get used 38 times in this one. Now, let's just do a real quick history up to this point of all of the times that Joy or joys will get used in already leaves of grass. You'll remember it in idolons and be my soul, joys, ceaseless exercises. You'll remember it starting from Pominock, passage 13, all hold spiritual joys, song of myself 24, each moment and whatever happens thrills me with joy, one hour to madness and joy, obviously is a classic poem, and then native moments, give me now libidinous joys only. So as we turn to a song of joys, we will be already blown away by how Whitman has used this word joy or joys throughout Leaves of Grass. And the energy is going to be here. Notice the language of enthusiasm, as we might call it, right? Now, from the very beginning, we got to point out, this is a poem that does not have that traditional numbered sections, the way, for example, we saw in Song of the Open Road. However, there are clearly sections, and we're going to work through those sections now. Now, if I had a, a, um, an unlimited amount of time, I would love to just read this entire poem with you, just to give you a sense of the way in which the crescendo is built. It is almost as if there is a chorus that's happening here, and we're building towards the crescendo at the very end. The final word of the poem is, in fact, the word joys. But we don't have the time, so we're going to work through this in sections. I hope you have your copy in front of you. And now let's go to work. Oh, to make the most jubilant song, full of music, full of manhood, womanhood, infancy, full of common employments, full of grain and trees. The opening three lines. Let's just annotate quickly. Notice we're going to begin with the word O oh, again, 41 times it gets used. Go back to starting from Pominock Passage 19, where 10 times in six lines it gets used. We're back to this attempt to try to capture enthusiasm through language. The word jubilant is an interesting word here. Song of the uh, Banner will, um, um, will uh, be uh, where we see this. Also, uh, Nay, Tell Me Not, and, uh, and, and, is, and as well, the, the poem ended day, triumph, transformation, jubilant, um, it's not exactly the same word, but it's going to capture it. And go and take a look at that poem. We're obviously going to get to it later in Leaves of Grass. Notice we're going to have a poem that's full of, full of, full of three times, right? Well, actually four times. Full of music, notice the use of the dasher. Full of manhood, womanhood, infancy. In other words, we're going to get the whole circle of life happening. Full of common employments, put that in your, in your notes. This is going to be a poem that celebrates the common, as so much of Leaves of Grass already has done. Full of grain, we think of Leaves of Grass, and obviously trees, Song of the Open Road, Passage 7. Why is it that I walk under certain trees and I'm never the same again? Then the next passage. Oh, for the voices of animals. We'll go back to, I think I could turn and live in the animals. You'll remember that one in Song of Myself. Oh, for the swiftness and balance of fishes. We're going to get to more fish references here in a second. Oh, for the dropping of raindrops in a song. We think of, Skelly, of, of uh, Shelley to a skylark. Oh, for the sunshine and motion of waves in a song. So this idea of sunshine, the sunny point of view, that's where we're headed. Now let's go to the next part. Oh, the joy of my spirit. Sometimes it's spirit, sometimes it's soul. Notice it is uncaged. That's the only use, interestingly. In all of these aggress, the only time uncaged gets used. It darts like lightning. We're going to get several very interesting uh, similes here. I think, go back and look at our, our lecture on Shelley's uh, To a Skylark. I think that Shelley's Skylark is in fact standing behind very much a whole bunch of this poem um, and the idea of how it darts like, sky, like lightning. It is not enough to have this globe or a certain time. I will have thousands of globes and all time. You'll remember in the opening lines of passage 46 of Song of Myself, I know I have the best of time and, and space and was never measured and never shall be measured. I tramp a perpetual journey, come listen all. We're playing the very similar kind of game here. We go back to Salute Amon and the way he talks about the globe there as well. Now we're going to begin to move through the poem, and he's going to celebrate different types of employment work. And we're going to begin with the engineer 
and the locomotive. Now remember, of course, the Transcontinental Railroad that will happen on the 10th of May in 1869, right? Oh, the engineer's joy to go with a locomotive to hear the hiss of steam. By the way, notice in this poem, it's brilliant the way it's done. He solicits all of the major um, senses as he plays the game. So to hear the hiss of steam, hear all these S sounds, the merry shriek, the steam whistle, the laughing locomotive, to push with resistless way and speed off in the distance. This word resistless is, is central to his understanding of progress. It's inevitable. We're going to get to more of that as we go. Right? Oh, the gleesome saunter. Think about poets to come in the way you use the word saunter. Over fields and hillsides. The leaves, obviously leaves of grass and flowers, of the commonest weeds. I told you that's going to be one of the common employments, commonest weeds. The moist, fresh stillness of the woods. We've seen much of this already, especially in Song of Myself. The exquisite smell of the earth at daybreak and all through the forenoon. The word exquisite you'll remember in Song, uh, in I Sing the Body Electric Passage 9. The, ex the exquisite realization of health. You love that word, exquisite. From here... We go now to the horseman and horsewoman's uh, joys. And obviously, those of us that live especially where we get to take care of and, and spend time around ponies, we love these set of lines. Oh, the horseman and the horsewoman's joys. The saddle, the gallop, the pressure upon the seat, the cool gurgling of the ears and, and hair. By the way, one other time the word gurgling gets used after the sea ship. You can take a look at it. And now from here we go to the fireman's joys. You'll remember in Song of Myself, passage 33, the mashed fireman and that really powerful scene. Now we're going to get more of the same. Oh, the fireman's joys. I hear the alarm at dead of night. I hear bells, shouts. We think, of course, I hear America singing, don't we? I pass the crowd. I run. The sight of the flames maddens me with pleasure. Only time the word maddens gets used in all of Leaves of Grass. Notice the way in which it appears that what he wants to do is somehow capture a scene. And then from that capturing of the scene, he will challenge us to see it with him. Do you remember what we said great writers do? They always show, don't tell. And we're going to see so much of that again in this poem as well. Oh, he says, the joy of the strong, broad fighter, towering in the arena in perfect condition, conscious of power, thirsting to meet his opponent. Now, we're not exactly sure who he's referencing, but it's probably the great, the, maybe the greatest of the fisticuffs uh, before the word boxer was utilized in this way. John, John uh, L. Sullivan, sometimes referred to as the Boston strong boy. He was really the first heavyweight champion. He was probably first, uh, the very first boxing superstar, and it's very possible that this will be celebrated here. Notice towering in the arena, in perfect condition, we think, obviously, of, uh, of this idea of the man in the arena in the Kipling poem, conscious of power, thirsting to meet his opponent. In some ways, this will be celebratory of how Whitman will see all great individuals as thirsting to meet the next great obstacle. And now from here, we go to a much different kind of referencing. Notice the genius from fighting. We now go to sympathy. Oh, the joy of that vast elemental sympathy, which with... Only, which only the human soul is capable of generating and emitting in steady and limitless floods. We obviously think about uh, our, our comments on Aristotle's poetics and the idea that what makes us so remarkable as humans is that, uh, you know, just like dogs, we can look at the sunset, but only one of us can truly appreciate it. That idea of sympathy or compassion, pathos, of course, Aristotle's worth. Then we move from here to the mother's joys. Now, of course, we saw this in I Hear America Singing. We've seen this several times. The celebration of the maternal. The watching, the endurance, the precious love, the anguish, the patently yielded life. The word anguish tells us that Whitman will provide us with a complete theodicy. He's going to see the pain and suffering of motherhood. He's also going to make this very interesting line, patently yielded life. Now, is he talking about a child who maybe passes, or is he talking about a mother who willingly gives up or yields her life to raise the child? You can, you can read it either way. It's a, it's a brilliant um, a word picture, though. Oh, the joy of increase, growth, recuperation, the joy of soothing and pacifying, the joy of concord and harmony. You think of music. And this is an interesting pair of lines that just kind of sits in this poem all by itself. Notice increase, growth, 
recuperation, all about progress, soothing, pacifying, concord and harmony. Whitman, as we've said, longed to believe that his set of lines, these poems, would somehow bring together America in harmony and there wouldn't be this horrific civil war that tragically we know happened, right? Oh, to go back to the place where I was born, and some of you right away will smile. You're like, oh, yes, I've heard that line. Oh, to go back to the place where I was born, to hear the birds sing once more, to ramble about the house and barn and over the fields once more and through the orchard and along the old lanes once more. Notice this once more. There was a child went forth as a set of lines we will get to that plays the same game. Some have argued that Whitman in Leaves of Grass is constantly trying to recapture the optimism and the joy, the exuberance of his youth. And he witnessed it in other youths and so he celebrated it that way and now he says, Man, I would love to go back to the place where I started. And what would I do? I'd hear birds singing. I'd ramble. Um, Song of Myself, Passage 13. Um, we'll see the use of this word, uh, the day-long ramble, right? The, the, love, the idea of walking as, as ambling, rambling. About the house, the barn, over the fields once more. Notice this once more. Through the orchard, along the old lanes. We think about uh, Song of the Open Road with this. Old lanes once more. And then... What is it that he's going to remember from his childhood, from his youth? Oh, to have been brought up on bays, lagoons, creeks, or along the coast. Whitman obviously grew up around the water, not just the land, which is why in passage 46, A Song of Myself, he plays around with the word pictures of both. So we'll go to work with it now. To continue and be employed there all my life. The briny and damp smell, again, always soliciting the senses. The shore, the salt weeds exposed at low water. And then back to Song of Myself, Passage 10, where he's going to play this game of being around the marine uh, workers, the work of fishermen, the work of eel fisher and clam fisher. And then all of a sudden, he's there, and we're there with him. I come with my clam rake and spade. I come with my eel spear. Is the tide out? I join the group of clam diggers on the flats. I laugh and work with them. I joke at my work like a meddlesome young man. In winter, I take my eel basket and eel spear and travel out on foot on the ice. I have a small axe to cut holes in the ice. Behold me well clothed, going gaily or returning in the afternoon. My brood of tough boys accompany me. My brood of grown and part grown boys who love to be with no one else so well as they love to be with me. By day to work with me and by night to sleep with me. Now it's a compelling uh, set of lines. Let's just go through it quickly. Notice we begin with this question, is the tide out? It's almost as if there would be this um, shouting to the to the lads you're working with. Is the tide out? Okay, let's go, let's go. I join the group. Notice I laugh, I work, I joke. By the way, interestingly, this word joke doesn't get used a lot in Lisa Grass. Song of Myself, Passage 8, um, shouted joke at my work. Like, it's an interesting simile. A meddlesome young man. Uh, again, his 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 ability to kind of capture this from singing young men and I hear America singing to now the the, the meddlesome joking young men in winter um, we're, we're going out and we travel out on foot on the ice and then he says look at me well clothed gaily returning in the afternoon and then it's a brood used twice of tough boys accompany me brood of grown and part grown boys who love to be with no one else so well as they love to be with me by day to work with me, by night to sleep with me, like Socrates with his young men. Of course, this got him in some trouble, right? As we talked about in Apology, we're playing a very similar kind of game. I'll let you read into this what you want to read into this in terms of Whitman's understanding of what he enjoys doing with young boys. But I'm going to say only about that. Notice the brilliance of the companionship. Camerero is the, uh, the word that got used, of course, in Song of the Open Road. Another time, now we're going to another memory. In warm weather, out in a boat to lift the lobster pots, and now we're going lobstering, right? Where they are sunk with heavy stones. I know the buoys. Oh, the sweetness of the fifth month morning, using the Quaker uh, phraseology for May. Upon the water as I row, just before sunrise towards the buoys, I pull the wicker pots up slantingly. The dark green lobsters, it's brilliant eye, right? Uh, are desperate with their claws as I take them out. I insert wooden pegs in the joints of their pinchers. You get the sense he's done this at some point in his life, right? I go to all the places, one after another, and then row back to the shore. There in a huge kettle of boiling water, the lobsters shall be boiled till their color becomes scarlet, right? Brilliant eye. 
Then, more fishing references. Another time, notice we're to this another time, another time, another time. These are all memories. Mackerel taking, voracious, mad for the hook. Near the surface, they seem to fill the water for miles. Another time, fishing for rockfish in Chesapeake Bay. I, one of the brown-faced crew. This idea of being brown-necked or brown-faced. In other words, out in the sun all the time. Another time, trailing for bluefish off Pominock. I stand with braced body. My left foot's on the gunwale. My right arm throws far out the coils. Notice again the, the detail here. Of slender rope inside around me, the quick veering and darting of 50 skiffs. My companions. Again, we go from the young boys who are his brood to his companions. Oh, Boating on the rivers. He loves his rivers. The voyage down the St. Lawrence, the superb scenery, the steamers. We think of Mark Twain here, don't we? The ship sailing, the Thousand Islands, the occasional timber raft, the raftsmen with long-reaching sweep, sweep oars, the little huts on the rafts, and the stream of smoke when they cook supper at evening. This little stream of smoke makes us think about that line from Tintern Abbey, words where Tintern Abbey, the, the smoke sent up, right, in silence. And then you've got this very interesting, sitting like right in the middle of this poem, in parenthetics, which makes us immediately think of our Emily Dickinson, right? Oh, something pernicious and dread, something far away from a puny and pious life, something unproved, something in a trance, something escaped from the anchorage and driving free, in parenthetics. Now, these are the kinds of things that, uh, lines that just make us kind of sit back and go, this is fascinating. Notice the use of five somethings here, right? Oh, something pernicious. By the way, the only, the only use of the word in all of Leaves of Grass and dread. We think of Hamlet in Act 3, right? The dread of something after, right? Something far away from a puny and pious life. In other words, he says, I, I, I want to I, I honor people who live real lives. He 